The board, the council previously had been made up of representatives from groups from all around the world. And uh, the elected board is going to uh, take, uh, take effect on January the 1st. And uh, it's geographical region based, basically <coughs> region based. Um, we did have a bit of a problem actually with, with this uh, because we at first thought, well, okay, Asia, Africa, Europe, North America, South America, Oceania, easy. No, it actually wasn't. Um, because uh, Asia is a very large area and Russia decided it was part of Europe and then other countries decided they wanted to be part of Europe anyway. So we actually had to modify our, our rules a bit about geographical regions. But it's working quite well and at the next IPS conference, which I'll mention in a moment, the new board will actually uh, sit for the first time. The IPS also has a publication called The Planetarium. Uh, it's been around for a very long time. Lots of articles about planetariums in the world, methods that you can use in planetariums, advertising from uh, producers of, of shows, equipment, all sorts of things. And it really is a wonderful thing. And you can get all but the, the most current issue, even if you're not a member, on the International Planetarium Society website. So you can read the past issues. Um, you can only get the current one if you're actually a member. IPS Council meets every year. Uh, here's a meeting we had in, pardon me, in Beijing in 2014. Uh, we have biennial conferences. That's every two years, in other words. Uh, and in 2006, we had one in the Southern Hemisphere for the first time. Melbourne Planetarium won the bid to host IPS 2006. We had over 300 people. Actually, our conferences tend to attract more than that, about four or 500 on the average, but having to come all the way to the Southern Hemisphere for some people is a bit far. But they did have a wonderful, wonderful time. And one of the most memorable was a, a purely astronomical experience in Victoria. Uh, we bust several hundred, or about two or three hundred of these people, almost everyone, out to the Astronomical Society of Victoria's dark sky site at Heathcote. Has anybody ever been there? It, yep, right. It is very, very good. And bear in mind, this was in winter 2006, on a night with no moon. And the, the only problem I had was getting people out of the bus. And you might think, well, hang on, how could that be? What was happening? is that astronomers from the Northern Hemisphere, never having seen this wonderful sight of Scorpius and Sagittarius, were stepping out of the bus, looking up and freezing. They stopped, they couldn't believe what they were doing. And I had to say, look, can you please move away from the bus? Look at the stars in a moment. Yeah. So it was a really wonderful place to have an IPS conference. Sorry? I'll still be there. Yeah, they'll still be there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, also at our conferences, uh, we have vendors from all around the world uh, displaying their star projectors, their equipment, all sorts of things, even books, um, um, planetarium equipment for the blind. There, there is just so much available that people will show off, take orders and so on at these conferences. They are well worth going to. Uh, now, speaking of the conferences, I've just got a few, few shots left I'm going to show you. Um, one of the big things that's being talked about right around the world in the planetarium industry right now is live shows. In some cases, completely live shows. In other words, no recorded program. Now, it's all very well to have these great shows that you pay the licenses for, and in fact, I'll just digress for a moment. Some of them are free. You can get some free content. And you can shop around for that, and I can give you a few pointers as to where we've got ours. European <laughs> Southern Observatory is one, for example. Um, but coming back to uh, live content, we find that our audience responds most positively to our live discussion of the night sky. In other words, not recorded, switch on the Zeiss, wait for all the gasps to die down as to how wonderful the sky looks, and talk to people about where they can find the Southern Cross and the pointers. The planets that are visible at the moment, and a few interesting points about what's just happened, like the space probe uh, Juno has, is in, has been in orbit around Jupiter. There's Jupiter now, and we're learning more about its interior, so they can identify what's up in the sky with the news they're hearing and the stuff they get on the internet. And this is such a big feeling amongst planetariums around the world that the 
whole theme of our conference in Toulouse, France last year was planetary life, as you can see here. So a lot of papers were presented about live shows in the planetarium, methods of talking about the stars, and so on. The conference was held at the Cité de l'Espace. Unfortunately, I didn't include slides here of the external area of this. They had models of spacecraft all over this huge area, uh, including what I think is either a two-thirds or full-scale model of an Ariane 5 rocket. Uh, and uh, the whole thing is a giant astronomical space park. Uh, they've done a wonderful, wonderful job. Here is their planetarium, another tilted dome planetarium, as you can see. Uh, and uh, here is an example of something that is uh, a major feature of our conferences, and that is the, the paper sessions, the talks that are given by our members. This lady is from the Ukraine, and she was giving a talk about how you can use toys to demonstrate astronomical and physics principles. <coughs> and there are so many toys you can use. I mean, the Splinky String spring is one of them. But she gave an absolutely gripping talk about how simple toys can help to explain science. And this is all part of what we do. It really is. Um, this slide's a little bit out of place, but I was talking about um, vendors who come to the conferences. Here's a Zeiss stand, for example, with some of their latest optics, pieces of planetarium projector, uh, so you can see how sharp the stars look on a little screen, and so on. Um, and you can get vendor products like, uh, like dome lighting. Uh, only in the last couple of years, we've installed LED lighting around the horizon of our dome, and it makes a huge difference. Of course, the LEDs are not directly visible, but the glow on the horizon all around from these LED, LEDs, RGBs, uh, all around is, is absolutely wonderful. So you can learn a lot about that at these conferences as well. Now I mentioned that Edmonton is the next, uh, Canada is the next conference. It's going to be in Edmonton next June. Uh, we're expecting probably five or six hundred there, which is really quite remarkable because our total membership is only about eight hundred. So something like two thirds to three quarters of our membership go to the international conferences. Uh, and it's wonderful to see all of that happen. So if you can go, you can go as a non-member but it's actually cheaper to buy a membership and pay the reduced fee, interestingly enough. If you feel like going to one of these, it really is a huge eye-opener. But as you'll see in just a moment, there's something that's much less expensive that I'm going to recommend. Before I do that, uh, here you can see, I mentioned the Japanese planetarium community. Uh, this is their planetarium conference in 2006. This is not the International Planetarium Society, this is just the Japanese Planetarium Society. Um, there were 250 registrants. 249 were Japanese. <laughs> and the, the guy with the, the light coloured jacket in the middle near the front is me. I stick out like a sore thumb. I should have photoshopped me out. It's very silly. Um, but close to home, we have our Australasian Planetarium Society. And if the AST is going to be, be operating a planetarium, we would love the AST to be a member. Um, we have uh, individual and also group membership, uh, institutional memberships. Uh, we have quite a number of members from around Australia and New Zealand. You can see us here in our um, conference in New Zealand in 2005. Roughly one in three is held in New Zealand. The next one is being held in February next year. It's only three months away and it's in Melbourne. So that provides a great opportunity for AST members to meet planetarium uh, staff from around the Australia New Zealand region. Just occasionally we have somebody coming from overseas. Uh, well, New Zealand is overseas, but I mean from outside the, the, the Australasian region. I'll finish off with uh, a slide I took some years ago in our old planetarium with our old Zeiss C Campy One projector. Some of you have met Chris Arcus, my colleague who works with me up there. He's over there on the right. Uh, of course, the sky is fake. Uh, it's done with Photoshop, as I'm sure you would have realised, but it's sort of one of our classic images that we use to, to advertise what a planetarium is all about. We are not in this particular room anymore. We're in that room that we saw uh, about 10 or 15 slides ago, where we're looking down onto the new ZKB3. Um, but we are very pleased that we've got what we've got. 
the Oncesson City Council is not made of money, so we have to do most things on the smell of an oily rag or grants and donations whenever we can. Um, but Chris and I work very well together to, uh, to keep the place going. Um, there are the occasional problems with this ice. Chris's electronics knowledge is absolutely wonderful, so he's the kind of person who'll say, oh, that's just blown up, you need another uh, Z23 switch on that, I'll just go out and get one. It's wonderful to have that kind of help, and uh, so as I say, we work very well together as a team. Um, just in closing, way back in 2004, we held a, um, or rather Zeiss, Zeiss held an expo in Germany to which many of us were invited. We, we travelled from all around the world, and of course what the top Zeiss were trying to do was get some sales. They wanted to show off their ZKB4, which was relatively new then, and various other things that they were, they were making and, and marketing. And there was a panel discussion about what planetariums are all about. And of course, Zeiss was hoping that we, I was on the panel, I was one of three or four people on the panel, Zeiss was hoping that we talk about how wonderful Zeiss was and, and all that kind of thing. Yeah, well, they are good. But, um, that wasn't what we were going to say. And all of us came, we, we all said the same thing, more or less. A planetarium is there to inspire. People are not going to remember everything they see in a planetarium show. If they remember one or two things, maybe three things, and or you, you, you hear a parent saying to a child, let's get the binoculars out tonight, you've done a good job. Um, they're not going to remember exactly how many moons Jupiter has. In fact, we have trouble remembering that these days. Um, they're not going to remember exactly how many kilometres it is to Alpha Centauri, but they'll know it's such a long way away that life's taken ages to get here. So those things you've been instilling in people's minds, and it really does inspire them to learn a lot more. And there are people out there who do need to learn a lot more. Not in this room, but we get lots of inquiries in the planetarium, many of which are very sensible and wonderful to receive, either by email, by letter, by phone, or by people who actually come in. But we get all sorts of weird ideas. Everybody's ideas are worth listening to, but some of them are a bit extreme. And maybe on your public nights you've had a few uh, interesting inquiries like that. Now, I had, I had a chap one day who rang me up to say he has proof that there is life on Mars. Absolute proof. And he'd bring it in to show me. Well, I couldn't resist this. <laughs> so I invited him in. He came up to the front counter of the museum. I met him, shook his hand, introduced myself, and said, okay, what, what do you have to show me? He had this huge roll of paper, and he unrolled it. And it was a great big picture of the surface of Mars. And he said, I can show you where they have built, they've got their farms, they've got their paddocks. I said, okay, let's have a look. He blown the picture up so large that the pixels were about that big. <laughs> they were square pixels all over the picture. And he And after learning that we couldn't actually survive on Mars without special equipment, he said, well, hang on, why can't we just keep Mars up so that it gets to be the same size as the Earth, then we'll be all right. Yeah, there's a few basic principles that were missing there. Um, one day I heard a lady ring up, in fact, it, was, it had the office girls um, rolling over in laughter because this person had run up before asking for me. And it was a lady who um, asked me, for some advice. She said, I need some advice. I said, what, what's, what's your problem? And she said, well, it's my boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh dear, she's, she's, this is going to be a good one. So I started off by saying, well, actually, you, I'm not sure you're speaking to the right person. <laughs> um, you, you've called the planetarium at the museum. She said, yeah, that's right. You're the astronomer. I said, okay. So what's your problem? She said, well, he's from Alpha Centauri. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. So I said, oh, it's a fair <coughs> I can see what your problem is, you know, but I didn't say it that way. Um, she said, um, yes, uh, and he said, but he said that um, because he's from Alpha Centauri, he's married, but because he's from Alpha Centauri, it's okay to be seen with me, to be with me. I said, right, well, look, um, I was trying to think of what to say, and then she said, 
all my friends think I'm crazy. And I, I saw a, a, a light came on in my head. And I said, okay, well, maybe what I can suggest is that you go and find somebody who is your very best friend and talk to that friend about your problems. And maybe that friend can help you out a lot more than I can. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. That's good. Bye. That was the end of the conversation. <laughs> yeah. And planetarium colleagues around the world get the same kind of things. Not those exact same things, but they get that a lot. And I will finish off with something I can tell you that has happened twice to me. And it will probably happen to you as well. If you run a planetarium, a lady came up to the door without a ticket one day. And she said, well, what's in there? So I said, oh, well, it's, this is the planetarium. And uh, we have uh, a dome ceiling. We project images of the stars and planets and so on. Uh, and our program is all about astronomy. And then she said, oh, so it's not really night time in there then. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, no, it's all done with special effects projectors. Oh, well, that would be interesting. All right, I'll, I'll come in and see the show. And that's happened to me twice. And she was serious. So, yeah, yeah. Planetariums are not very well known in Australia compared to Europe and the United States and Japan. So you may have some people confusing it with an observatory or in some rare cases confusing it with a place where you could really turn the angel and nothing different. And in a way, that's a compliment because that's really what we do. I'll leave you with those thoughts. Um, I'm going to be meeting Michael in the morning, as Michael's mentioned. Uh, out at the site to talk a bit more about the project. Um, I certainly hope it goes ahead. Um, meanwhile, if any of you are in one system, do come and see the planetarium, uh, see what we do up there, uh, and it'll always be good to see you. Uh, I think I've spoken for a little bit too long. I'll leave you with those thoughts, and thank you very much for having me here this evening. <laughs>
fit in with a planetarium? Very, very well. Um, in fact, several planetariums have them, and occasionally at the IPS conferences, you will see vendors who are actually producing, you know, showing off the latest version of this. So basically what you're describing is a sphere in the middle of the room, projectors mounted around the room, right? The yep. end of that sphere. Yep. So each projector is showing part of the surface detail of a planet, um, weather patterns, um, ocean depths, whatever you like. Uh, and it's very, very effective because you're standing there watching this thing rotating. It's only the image, of course, that's rotating in front of you. Yeah, they're very good. Yeah, one, one had a, one of the tsunami that uh, in Japan a couple of years ago, you could see the wave coming across the Pacific Ocean, reflecting off America and then coming back. Yeah, yeah. This is another method of data visualization. It's almost the reverse of a projection planetarium from the inside. Yeah, it is, yeah. It's projecting onto the outside of the sphere. But yeah, they're very effective. Are, yeah. If you can get one, yeah, get one. They're about $100,000. Yes, that's all. Yeah, that's <laughs> all. <laughs> 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 so the slideshows, are they built in for the location of the other you essentially project exactly what you would see if you were standing outside? Yes, that's right. Yes, that's all. And account for the By live show. I mean a, a, an extended tour of the night sky. Um, but it can also include video full dome clips that you might just have want to include while you're talking. Um, if you've got a system in which you, you have a digital sky which you've got complete control over, you can do all sorts of things like uh, if you're talking about Jupiter, zoom in on Jupiter and have the latest image come up. But live meaning not recorded. So you can do anything you like. Now, in our planetarium, our two systems are completely different. The Zeiss projector in the middle of the room and the video projection all over the dome are completely independent. The only thing that they have in common is the only main power. So if one of them fails, we can use the other one only and apologise to the audience. So what has happened is that sometimes our projection system, our digital system, has failed. The data projector won't boot up properly or won't talk to the computer. You know what the problem is, you can now. Sometimes, and we have done completely live shows with the Zeiss only. And we've advertised that in the museum. This afternoon shows will be live only. We filled the house. Something to bear in mind. The, the recorded shows are good, and they can be very popular. But having the right person in the planetarium as the presenter is the most important aspect. Whatever your equipment is, if you've got the right person at the helm, you can do one. Mm -hmm. Yes. You spoke before that you made film or whatever yourself. So is that something that you then use the, on the dome thing that made a square film on the dome? Um, not quite sure what you mean, but do you, do you mean? You use the program to make it into a dome. Oh yes, yes indeed. So for example, I mean there are various bits of software that will do this that will allow you to make your own video productions. Yes. The one that we use is called After Effects, as I think I, think I mentioned, the full down plugin mm -hmm. yes. into After yes. Effects. Yes. It's an Adobe product, uh, like Photoshop and so on, and comes as a suite called CS. I don't know what these numbers are up to now. Adobe Creative Suite, I think it's called. Yes. Anyway, so yes, so imagine sitting at a computer screen with all the bells and whistles and the things to feel. But fundamentally, you're looking at a certain image that you're building. And you have a timeline. So you might say, okay, I want Jupiter to appear fading in over five seconds at a bearing of about 275, with the middle of it about 30 degrees above the horizon. So you drag in your picture of Jupiter, you stick it in the timeline, you tell it when to fade in and fade out, what the azimuth and altitude should be, and then you do your next bit and your next bit and so on. And then you render that out into a mod file or an AVI or whatever sort of system you have. It takes a lot of practice to do it well, but it's very rewarding to be able to do it. But arguably, you get the little bit square and just do one to one. Oh, yes, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. If you, but although, on your monitor, you've actually got a round image to begin yeah, with. You may indeed drag a square image into it, and it will still appear rectangular on your dome if you need it to. Um, yeah, you can do that, but it's very, it's very versatile. And um, So if you've got some astronomical event coming up, like the transit of Venus in 2117, 
um, you could put together a, a little mini show of the, yeah. the sun with the dot on it, just to show people just like, how yeah. did you get yeah. yeah. Laurie, that's your old projector. It is. Where is it? It's on display as a museum piece. <laughs> so is it near the door? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. how, how, how strong is it folded down? <laughs> It was a good machine of its time. It's, uh, it's quite dated now. This particular model, the very first version of this model, uh, began production in 1941, I think it was, uh, and they updated it in 1954. It was so successful it remained in production until 1976. So that covered a lot of techni technical, uh, technical innovations over that period. Um, I have had at least one or two ZEISS representatives almost cursing themselves or cursing ZEISS for having made it so well. Because people who have one of these hardly ever want to run that. Um, and they use tessile lenses. And if you know ZEISS lenses, tessiles are very good lenses. Uh, so the image, the star images are very sharp. Very out of date now. Purely uh, electric, not even electronic. You know, it, 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 you, you move the thing in diagonal motion by turning a great big knob, which is on a wire wound pot. Um, to those of you who are into electronics will probably appreciate what I mean. Uh, it looked pretty archaic, uh, but it worked. It worked. The planet seems to go across the floor, doesn't that? The stars. Now, why do they have to tell you why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they did. They did. The stars don't. Uh, incidentally, the way the way you avoid having the stars go down onto the floor is that in an optomechanical projector you have little shutters, uh, such that as soon as the projector goes through the point where it's level and goes down, <coughs> this cup-shaped shutter will cut the light off. On this model, it didn't work with the planets, so uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 I'm oh, sorry, I shouldn't have said it so loudly. No, it was in Hobart, in fact. Um, this particular projector was bought by the Adult Education Board in 1965 for about £9,000. Now, to give you an idea how much that was, my father bought a house in King Street, Sandy Bay, at about the same time for $8,000. Dollars. A pound was two dollars. This would have bought you two houses in King Street, Sandy Bay at the time. Seriously. They're very expensive machines. So when I tell you that the current model is a million dollars, you can see it's remained roughly, <laughs> roughly the same proportion. Yeah, you can't get two houses in King Street. No, probably not in King Street. You can't get two in this farm. Yeah, you can't get two in this farm. You can't get two in this farm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 that's true. You can pay a million dollars in King Street. I think my dad sold the King Street house. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> More questions? Um, do a lot of the Launceston primary schools go through your... A lot. A lot, yes. Um, we get the complete spectrum from prep up to grade 10, uh, and occasionally from the Launceston College. Um, the vast majority of our schools do come from the Launceston area, the greater Launceston area, Launceston municipality. Is there any contact with the, the schools? The schools are uh, contacted through our education office in the museum, which sends out information to all the schools about what planetarium shows are available, come and visit us, all that kind of thing. So we in the planetarium don't contact the schools, but we have other people who do it. We have a bookings officer for the museum who takes the bookings for us as well. So um, it's, it's a pretty well-oiled machine where we work, and uh, we, uh, we accommodate up to about four or five schools a day, roughly five, uh, at peak times. Um, one or zero in, in, on slow days. Yeah. <laughs> as well, um, ASD members still get a free entry into this? Yes, they do. You can no. come in for free. Um, that's, that's a perk of being an ASD member. Just to mention that at the door, um, at the planetary, the entrance to the museum, if they're unsure about what, what all this is about, because we change staff all the time, they're supposed to know the rule, just call me all this, and we'll explain it to them. So, do come along and see a show. Yeah. And of course, if you if you come along and see a show and you're from the AST, now when the rest of the audience will come, we'll probably show you a few extra things that we do with our ice projection as well. Um, to give you a bit, a bit of an idea of what the other things we do there are. So not if they're on the school group you're coming up. Oh no, that's right, that's right. <laughs> and then sometimes we do, sometimes they're they're back to back um, on a busy day. 
Uh, school holidays are a busy time, not for schools, of course, but for the public. And um, public figures go up dramatically during school holiday time, really dramatically. But all those shows, Martin, how many presenters do you have? How many presenters? Currently, a total of five. Chris and myself, we are permanent staff members there, so we can never go on holiday at the same time. But for Saturdays, most of the Saturday shows are run by volunteers from the Astronomical Society of Tasmania. Yeah. So if any of you are thinking of moving to Launceston, and there's somebody here who just moved from Launceston, <laughs> where is he? Yes, Michael was one of our great uh, Saturday presenters in the planetarium. Um, so yes, we, we have volunteers who do it on a voluntary basis, and they're all very good. They know their school, they know their astronomy. Yes. You'll make a good volunteer for our, our planetarium. No, you won't. Well, you'll make an excellent volunteer for your planetarium. <laughs> As many of you here would, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank Martin for his fantastic presentation and his. Um... <laughs>